Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the Baker Institute. I think we have a, a very good program this evening, one that you'll find of interest. Uh, our speaker this evening uh, has been a friend uh, for many years, and uh, uh, we have uh, gotten involved in a lot of activities together over the years. Uh, he's a professor emeritus uh, of, uh, in, of uh, political science and international affairs at uh, George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. And he was on the faculty of George Washington University for 38 years until he retired in 2008. Uh, he, his research activities have focused on uh, really policy and uh, uh, international aspects of uh, U.S. and international uh, space activities. And uh, he has written many articles and published uh, many reports and uh, written a number of books. Uh, decision, to, decision to Go to the Moon, Project Apollo, and National Interest. He's also been the, uh, the general editor of uh, Exploring the Unknown, which uh, is a selected documents in uh, in the history of the U.S. space program. And, uh, of course, he's the recipient of many honors and awards. And this evening he's going to talk to us uh, about his most recent book, which is John F. Kennedy and the Race to the Moon. So let me present John Logson. Thank you, George. Great. I have a George Abbey story to start with. Uh, there were lots of George Abbey stories. When George was in Washington working with Dan Golden uh, in, in helping to run NASA, uh, one of my colleagues, the Washington Post uh, beat reporter for space, a woman named Kathy Sawyer, said, who is that guy who sits in the corner and never says anything? Is he important? <laughs> I think the question has been answered. Uh, as George said, uh, I, I wrote a book 41 years ago, or it was published 41 years ago, called John F. Kennedy, no, called The Decision to Go to the Moon, Project Apollo and the National Interest. So why, after 40 plus years, do I return to this topic? Well, there are a couple of reasons, and you'll see most of them in, in the presentation tonight. One is, is, is uh, that uh, making the decision was only part of uh, the story, carrying out, implementing the decision was equally important, and, and that story had not been told before this book. Um, there is a fair amount of material that's become available, particularly with the Kennedy li Library archives uh, opening uh, up, and, and I wanted to add to that. And fortunately, the basic uh, account in, in the 1970 book stands. And then third, there was one theme uh, even in uh, early 1961 that I totally missed, and I'll tell you about that when I get to it. Uh, so uh, all in all, this is a book I've been working on for a long time. I, I, I hope I work good, but I don't work fast. Now let's see. Okay, so the, here, it's good PowerPoint and teaching technique. Here are the things I'm going to discuss. Uh, you know, some history, about half, half the talk history, maybe a little more, and then uh, some of my reflections on, on uh, what Apollo was and wasn't in terms of a success and whether it tells us anything about today's rather uncertain situation. I think one of the things that uh, people who don't know this story don't know is that Kennedy really didn't know much, didn't care much about space coming to uh, the presidency. He had used uh, the missile gap and the space gap as a rhetorical tool to talk about the, uh, in the, in the uh, 1960 campaign, saying Eisenhower had failed the country and it was uh, time to get the country moving. But he really wasn't strongly committed to any particular view in space. And probably the most uh, uh, visible evidence of that was that he delegated uh, lead responsibility within his administration to his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, to give Lyndon something to do so he didn't get in the way of important things. <laughs> uh, um, um, that didn't last very long, by the way. Uh, 
as President Eisenhower, as Dwight Eisenhower left the White House and John Kennedy entered in January of 61, there was very high uncertainty about the future of the US program, and particularly of human spaceflight. Project Mercury was approaching its first flight, but there was no follow-on program approved. NASA had proposed a program with a three-person Earth orbiting capsule and perhaps a circumlunar flight, and that program was already called Apollo. Uh, but Eisenhower had refused to fund it, uh, and, and uh, so the Air Force had, it was in the middle of a rather vigorous campaign to recoup the lead role in space that it had lost post-Sputnik, uh, and, and all that uncertainty uh, w was there as Kennedy uh, took office. Uh, the last major appointment he made on January the 30th was the NASA administrator, James E. Webb, Somewhere between 19 and 26 people had been considered for the job before Mr. Webb's name popped to the top. Variety of reasons, one was uncertainty, others didn't want to work under Lyndon Johnson. Um, and, and, and so Kennedy finally got fed up and said to his science advisor, Jerry Wiesner, and to Lyndon Johnson, if you don't find somebody, I will. And that catalyzed uh, action. It was actually Senator Robert Kerr of Oklahoma that suggested Webb. And everybody's kind of said, hmm, that's a good idea. Uh, Webb, from the start, was an activist NASA administrator. He came in. He said, Mr. President, the program you've inherited is a, uh, a follower program, not a leadership program. We need more money. Sounds familiar uh, in NASA. And uh, went before Kennedy in March of 1961 with a request for a significant budget increase for both uh, increasing propulsion power and for funding the follow-on human spaceflight program. Kennedy said, well, I know we're in a tail chase with rockets. Uh, I'll give you a little money, but I haven't made up my mind about human spaceflight yet. That was March the 23rd, 1961. Three weeks later, Yuri Gagarin, and that changed the stakes. That dramatized to Kennedy uh, the importance politically, internationally, symbolically of space achievements, particularly dramatic space achievements. And uh, the Soviet Union was not modest about tr uh, trumpeting its success, Khrushchev saying this proves the superiority of the Soviet system. Uh, Again, for the younger people in here, even for the middle-aged people in here, it's hard to remember, you don't remember unless you've read about it, the environment in 1960, uh, 61 of Cold War competition, newly independent countries uh, choosing which social system to organize, whether it's a socialist collective system uh, as exemplified by the Soviet Union or democratic capitalism. Uh, uh, like the U.S., uh, and, and this was very much on Kennedy's mind. He called a meeting two days after the Gagarin flight, and the date is important, uh, uh, with people from NASA, with his budget people, and with his science people, and said, what do I do? What options are open to me? There, probably for the first time, he heard, well, with adequate resources, we could probably get people to the moon. So he wasn't ready to make that decision that day, but, uh, but did say as he left the room, uh, there's nothing more important. The date is important because the question, uh, a, a historian type question is how much influence the Bay of Pigs had on Kennedy's decision. It happened, the, the invasion started April the 17th, uh, Cuban exiles trained by the CIA hoping to overthrow uh, the Castro regime. Kennedy, after initially approving the, uh, the invasion, uh, decided it was too risky, didn't provide the promised military support, and while the Soviet Union had looked strong and successful, this new young president looked wavering and kind of weak before the world, and it clearly influenced and reinforced a commitment, but I think the commitment was already there uh, to do something in space. Kennedy talked to his science advisor and said, you know, if there was something else we could do, 
desalinization or nation building or some other way of, of demonstrating our strength, our technological competence to the world, we do it. But uh, the Soviet Union has defined this as a space game and we more or less have to play by the rules that they have defined. Um, on April the 20th, uh, in the aftermath of the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy met with Johnson on the 19th John, uh, to ask him to conduct a review uh, of, of options for accelerating the program. Uh, and, and Johnson asked for a memo and, and he got this one-page requirements document from uh, President Kennedy uh, with the operative paragraph being the one in, in the balloon. Uh, you know, is there any other space program which promises dr dramatic results in which we could win? Pretty clear requirements. Nothing to do with space exploration. Uh, a lot to do with Cold War competition. Uh, and that's a theme that I want to leave you with, is that Kennedy was not a space visionary. Uh, he, he was a, uh, a, a pragmatic political leader who made the judgment that the United States could not by default allow the Soviet Union to continue to be first in every dramatic space achievement. The choice of the moon was really a choice uh, based on a technical calculation. The Soviet Union had then and has now a very good rocket, now called Soyuz, at that time called Semenyorka or R-7, which was built as an ICBM to launch a very heavy nuclear warhead because the Soviet Union had not made the breakthroughs that allowed its warhead to be light. So the booster had to be powerful. And that booster was powerful enough, it was calculated, particularly by von Braun, uh, to do everything in space, even perhaps sending one person looping around the moon, but that to land people on the surface of the moon, both the United States and the Soviet Union would have to build a, a new rocket. And von Braun, being von Braun, said in that rocket building competition, we will win, given adequate resources. Uh, and he was right. Um, the political rationale was provided by uh, uh, a memo uh, put together by staff over the weekend of May 6th and 7th, delivered to the White House uh, to Lyndon Johnson on May the 8th, and he immediately uh, uh, delivered it to the president with a cover letter saying, uh, I agree with it. He was leaving, he, Johnson, was leaving town uh, on the e evening of the 8th to go on an inspection tour of what the U.S. involvement should be in Southeast Asia. These things kind of run together. And you see the quotes. I mean, it's again, it's, it's wonderful re Cold War rhetoric. Uh, Large-scale space projects uh, aimed at enhancing national prestige are part of the battle along the fluid front of the Cold War. And something I think you know, we can talk about uh, in, in Q&A, whether it's still valid, that it's men, not merely machines, that captures the imagination of the world. Uh, Kennedy accepted the recommendations, which were an across-the-board acceleration of the program. Kennedy got more than he had bargained for. He wanted one thing to beat the Soviet Union. The space community saw an opportunity to accelerate uh, communication satellites, meteorology satellites, nuclear power, uh, really an across the board acceleration. One thing that had to happen and showed Kennedy, I think, at, at his best, uh, was, was a successful fl first flight, suborbital flight in Project Mercury. Uh, the uh, scientific community was very worried prior to the Gagarin flight in particular of whether a human could actually survive going into space, the acceleration of a launch, the rapid transition to zero gravity, then the acceleration uh, upon reentry. And uh, they, success, they uh, uh, suggested lots more centrifuge tests and lots more uh, test launches using chimpanzees to which Robert Gilruth's response was, let's move the program to Africa. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Kennedy became personally involved in the decision of whether to go ahead with Mercury, uh, with a Shepard flight, coming so soon after the Bay of Pigs, and the US had said it would televise it live. Uh, 
And finally, he was convinced that the risks were acceptable uh, and said, all right, we're going to go ahead with it and, and cross our fingers. Uh, the picture on top here is Kennedy, LBJ, and Mrs. Kennedy, uh, and, and others in the background who were called out of a National Security Council meeting, not Jackie, uh, but the rest of them, watching a little black and white television in Kennedy's secretary's office, watching the Shepard launch. Uh, and then on the same day that Kennedy received a recommendation to set a lunar landing as a national goal, all seven Mercury astronauts came to the White House uh, to, for, so that uh, Shepard could get his uh, medal after, after his flight. And then they went into the Oval Office and, and, and it was the first time Kennedy met the seven astronauts and he clearly found in them the kind of personalities he liked. Uh, risk takers, people with boldness, with, as Tom Wolf said, the right stuff. Uh, after necessary budget review, and the, if you read the document uh, budget review of the proposal, uh, you see that, that it was pretty spe clearly spelled out before Kennedy made this decision what its implications would be. This you probably have seen. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Kennedy sensed that the speech was not going over that well. That declaration was not met with great applause, but uh, kind of, what? Yeah. And, and he started improvising, stressing that this was the kind of commitment that the whole country had to make. Most of what you'll hear now was, was extempora done extemporaneously, not in his speech text. I believe we should go to the moon, but I think every citizen of this country, as well as the members of the Congress, should consider the matter carefully in making their judgment, to which we've given attention over many weeks and months because it is a heavy burden, and uh, there is no sense in uh, agreeing uh, or desiring that the United States take an affirmative position in outer space unless we are prepared to do the work and bear the burdens to make it successful. If we are not, we should decide today and this year. That's what got the applause. That's where my 1970 book ended. Uh, but as I said at the start, making a declaration, I mean, George H.W. Bush said we should return to the moon this time to stay. George W. Bush said we should go back to the moon uh, by 2020. Neither of those happened. Kennedy's proposal was implemented, followed up by the actions to make it real. Uh, and and uh, the rest of, of the history part of this is, is showing that that wasn't a straightforward process. Uh, first of all, it was a massive warlike but peaceful mobilization of financial and human resources. Uh, I mean, compared to today's budget uh, struggles, I mean, look at the numbers. 89% uh, increased the first year to 101% the second year, 40% the third year. Uh, a, a massive investment in facilities at Launch Complex 39 uh, on Merritt Island. NASA doubled in its civil service complement, or almost doubled, and the contractor uh, uh, workforce went up by f uh, basically four times. This, this was an unparalleled peacetime uh, commitment. I've looked for some analogs, uh, tried to convert everything into $2010. You see the number. I mean, it's, uh, what, 20 times larger than the commitment required to build the Panama Canal, five or six times larger than the Manhattan Project. The only thing I could find anywhere close was uh, 
the interstate highway system, but that was over 35 years and funded off budget, not by annual appropriations. And just to give you a sense uh, of, of comparison to current situations, here are the NASA's costs. I got these numbers from NASA uh, of, 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 of station and shuttle. Uh, we clearly have spent on the shuttle program more money than we spent uh, on Apollo, but over 40 years, not over uh, 12 or 13. Uh, uh, so the money has been there, but not in the focused, concentrated uh, way that it was for Apollo. Most of the decisions on where to locate the facilities were relatively uncontroversial. There were 20 some uh, places considered as launch sites. The, the last two were someplace near Cape Canaveral Air Force Station uh, and Cumberland Island in Georgia, just north of the, um, of the Florida border. Uh, and the final decision was that there was already so much ground infrastructure in Florida that it made sense to locate the facilities there. And so Merritt Island, uh, land was purchased to build uh, the launch operations center. Uh, you needed to test the F-1 engines, a place out in the woods where uh, the, the uh, locals, like, other than the snakes, would not be disturbed. And that led to what's now Stennis Space Center. You had a big facility to assemble the uh, first stage of the Saturn V rocket, uh, and that uh, was a empty uh, World War II tank factory uh, in, in New Orleans at Michoud. Um, the only controversy was where to establish the new center to manage the human spaceflight program to manage Apollo. And you all know the outcome. Uh, but it's not clear people here fully understand what happened. The key actor was not Lyndon Johnson. It was uh, the chairman of NASA's Appropriations Committee in the House, Albert Thomas. LBJ got the center named after him. Mr. Thomas got a post office. You know, life isn't always fair. Thomas had made it very clear, even going back to Keith Glennon and NASA in 1959, that if NASA wanted uh, money for a new program, uh, uh, the, the new center that for, to manage spaceflight, which turned out to be Goddard, had been snuck in while Thomas was out of town. Uh, and, and he said, that's not going to happen again. Uh, LBJ uh, uh, was out of the country when Mr. Thomas talked to Mr. Webb. Uh, George Brown had been consulted by uh, Johnson and, and uh, uh, Webb uh, during the buildup to the decision uh, and, and was clear already in, in May, April and May of 61 that he, Houston had to have serious consideration. But NASA had also lots of pressure and the president had lots of pressure uh, to locate this clearly headlined facility around the country. Senator Symington of Missouri said St. Louis is a wonderful place. Uh, the California congressional delegation said West Coast would be wonderful. And in particular, the governor of Kennedy's home state, John Volpe, said ideal place would be in the Boston area. Uh, and and, and uh, ultimately, there was a process of uh, uh, 23 sites being considered uh, and uh, the land available for NASA at Clear Lake, then kind of owned by Humble, but dedicated for Rice for a, a research facility that Rice could give to the government, was the second choice. First choice was MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida, which was intended to be surplus for Air Force needs. The Air Force changed its mind and uh, said, uh, we're going to use it. And Houston and uh, in, in the Clear Lake site rose to the top of the list. I'm not sure James Webb, being the politically sensitive person he was, would have accepted the recommendation to locate in uh, Florida, knowing the political situation with respect to Mr. Thomas and Johnson, of course. But, but uh, uh, again, the veterans of 
uh, Texas politics can, who can remember when it was a democratic state uh, know that, that there wasn't one Democratic Party in, in uh, Texas in those days. There were several, and Johnson was in one faction and Thomas was in another. They really didn't like each other very much. Uh, so, uh, September the 14th, 1961 was the announcement that Houston had been chosen as a center for the, as a location for the new manned spacecraft center. And I gather, George tells me that at least uh, up here, that date was celebrated last week. Um, but that's the right date. By 19, late 1961, the decision to do some form of rendezvous was made. The decision to put a fifth engine in the bottom of a Saturn Four engine design was made, which led to Saturn V. And then over the first six months of 62, the debate over what kind of rendezvous culminated in a NASA decision to use lunar orbit rendezvous as the approach to getting to the moon. Um, that uh, decision was greatly opposed by uh, Kennedy's science advisor and the President's Science Advisory Committee. As he prepared for his budget decisions in the fall of 62, Kennedy was advised he should go out and do a little bit of an inspection tour and see what was going on with the program he had started. So he went first to Huntsville, where uh, he stood by as Wiesner and Webb got in a rather vigorous argument about the merits of the lunar orbit rendezvous choice. Uh, and, and finally, Kennedy cut it off and said, you know, the, the press is standing there listening to this uh, and it's probably not a good place to debate this issue. He saw uh, the, a test of, of, of an F-1 engine and then he went to Florida and then finally came to Houston where on September 12th of 62, so 50 years next year, uh, he made his most famous and well-known speech uh, in support of the space program. Uh, here's some of it. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. Kennedy did not have a Texas accent. <laughs> uh, on this same trip, for the first time, Kennedy met a man named Brainerd Holmes, who was put in charge of running the Apollo program. And uh, Dr. Holmes, would tell the, uh, the president that with some additional money, the uh, first landing on the moon might be as early as 1966. The planning date at that point was the last quarter of 1967. Uh, and, and after uh, that encounter with Kennedy, Kennedy asked Webb, is that possible? What would be involved? And he never got an answer because OMBOB then, not Bureau of the Budget, uh, intercepted uh, uh, Webb's return letter and didn't present it to the president. And Holmes kept pushing for additional money. And when he kept being turned down by Webb and his associates, he went leaked to the press and it appeared in Time magazine uh, that Jim Webb was not supporting the president's program and that somebody had to go, either Holmes or Webb, and it wasn't necessarily Holmes. Uh, Kennedy didn't like that sort of thing being aired in public, called a meeting both to discuss uh, the fiscal 63 budget, I guess it would be, uh, uh, and to find out what was going on internal to NASA. After the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy had installed a secret taping system in the, in the Oval Office in the cabinet room. And this meeting was recorded. Uh, and the whole transcript is, is fascinating. But it's the clearest statement of why Kennedy thought it was important to go to the moon. <laughs> 
that it could affect the design of, of the apartment. Yeah, the other thing is, I would certainly not favor spending a six or seven billion dollars to find out about space, no matter how uh, on the schedule we're doing. I'd sell it out over a five or ten year period. If we could spend it on why we spend seven billion dollars on getting fresh water from small water when we're spending seven billion dollars to find out about space. But so obviously you wouldn't put it on that priority except for the, except for the defense implication. And uh, and the second point is the uh, the uh, fact that the Soviet Union uh, has uh, made uh, this a, a task of the system. So that's why we're doing it. So I think we've got to take the view that this is the key program and the rest of it, God, so that we can find out about it, but there's a lot of things we want to find out about. But you see, we can't answer everything else. When you talk about uh, uh, this, it's very hard to draw a line what, between what I the minute I think everything that we do ought to really be tied into getting onto the moon and ahead of the Russians. Why can't it be kind of preeminent in space, which are your own? Be because by God, we keep, we've been telling everybody we're preeminent in space. Five years, nobody believes that. <laughs> Webb actually won the argument. In 1963, uh, Kennedy started saying the point isn't getting to the moon, the point is creating a dominant space capability and being preeminent in space. Uh, fascinating discussion. There is a kind of urban myth that Kennedy got up in 1961, said, let's go to the moon, and everybody said, yea, verily, and the program went forward uh, without a hitch. That's not at all accurate. And the criticisms took a while to develop, but in 1963, the program came under criticism from all sides. President Eisenhower called it nuts. Uh, the security-oriented wing of the Republican Party said, the real th Soviet threat is 200 miles over our head in low Earth orbit. Why are we worrying about beating Russia to the moon? And the scientific and, and liberal communities said, this is wrong priorities. We ought to spend the money on education, housing, uh, training teachers, etc." Kennedy was bothered by these criticisms. There were a series of reviews during the year. And the program was in trouble. Holmes finally left in uh, June. He was replaced by a man named George Miller. Dr. Miller came in, commissioned a quick look at the program, and found that it was three to four years behind schedule, uh, and, and uh, made a critical decision called all-up testing that I think was essential to m meeting the end-of-the-decade goal. And Congress, which had been supportive, s cut the budget uh, by 10%. Uh, this bothered, all of this bothered Kennedy. I think by September of 63, he had lost a lot of his enthusiasm uh, 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 about the program. This was kind of his low point. And he met with Webb, and this is very hard to hear, on September the 18th, uh, saying, you know, there's not a lot of political positives on the program. You gotta really I think push this out. Like a lot of things, it's sort of mid journey, and therefore, we think like that's how do we make this trip for? That's right. But uh, at the end of the thing, they may be glad we made it. But I think we've got to defend ourselves now. And I think, at least it's clear to me that unless the Russians do something spectacular, the only way we can defend ourselves is to put a national security rather than a prestige yeah. label on there. Kennedy was perfectly capable of doing two things at the same time. Uh, and in this case, he pursued two approaches to defending Apollo. One was to suggest cooperation with the Soviet Union in going to the moon. And the other was, as he said there, create some sort of military shield uh, to uh, justify the program. The thing I missed in the 1970 book was Kennedy's interest in cooperation with the Soviet Union. And I talked to a lot of informed and NASA audiences uh, since this book came out, and I asked how many people knew that Kennedy uh, proposed going to the moon together with the Soviet Union, and the usual answer is one and a half people in a hundred remember it. Uh, and it wasn't exactly a secret. And Kennedy, in his inaugural address, had said, let us go to the moon together, let us explore the stars together. Uh, when he met uh, Khrushchev for the one and only time, 10 days after his May the 25th announcement, he proposed to Khrushchev cooperation in going to the moon, and, and Khrushchev said no. And then, anybody who's been paying attention to the news today knows that the General Assembly of the United Nations is meeting in New York City now, 
and it's the time of the year where heads of state come and, and, and make grand statements, and Kennedy did that on this date 48 years ago, September 20th, 1963. And I say nobody in the space community remembers. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. There's some controversy of whether Kennedy was serious in, in the literature. I think he was. He and his associates took a lot of steps over the following two months to try to feel out the Soviet Union and figure out what kind of cooperation might be possible. Uh, Khrushchev didn't respond until November the 1st, in which Tammy said, why not? You know, why not have a, a Soviet man and an American woman go to the moon together? Um, just as a kind of sidebar, the Soviet Union at this point didn't have a lunar program to cooperate with. That decision was not made in until December of 64. It was beginning to build a, a big booster, the N1 booster, launched four times with four failures. Uh, but CIA estimates, national intelligence estimates, could not provide any physical evidence that the oh, Soviet no. Union had a lunar program. That's because they did not. Uh, so fundamentally, the U.S. was racing itself during uh, the Kennedy administration. One of the questions I don't feel totally satisfied with in, in my book because I think you would have to talk to the people and the people are now all uh, passed away was how close we came in November, October and November of 63 to changing the Apollo goal, to giving it up, to postponing it beyond the end of the decade, to saying, well, the real point is the booster strength and let's just go to demonstrating Saturn V but not use it to go to the moon. Clearly that debate was raging inside the government in October and November of uh, 63. Uh, what Kennedy would have done is an interesting question which I'll come to in a minute. But he regained his enthusiasm. He visited the Cape six days before he was killed briefed for the first time in front of a model of the VAB in the Saturn V by George Miller. Bob Siemens, the uh, associate administrator, said maybe for the first time he understood the magnitude, uh, the dimensions of what he had approved. And then uh, he went out and looked at the Saturn I on the launch pad ready for a December launch with an upper stage which, when it was launched, would surpass the Soviet Union in lifting power, and that really impressed Kennedy uh, in, in terms of that was what he wanted, was a, a bigger booster than the Soviet Union. Uh, here's, a, unfortunately, no sound, but von Braun, uh, in that briefing, you'll see why I like this image. That's the book cover. <laughs> what would he have done if he had lived? Um, continue to push for cooperation, turn off the clock, back off the lunar goal, stay the course. Here's my favorite Kennedy space speech, the day before he was killed at the dedication of the Aerospace Medical Center in San Antonio. We have a long way to go, many weeks and months and years. The long, tedious work lies ahead. There will be setbacks and frustrations and disappointments. There will be, as there always are, pressures in this country to do less in this area as in so many others, and temptations to do something else that's perhaps easier. But this research here must go on. This space effort must go on. The conquest of space must and will go ahead. That much we know, that much we can say with confidence and conviction. Frank O'Connor, the Irish writer, tells in one of his books, How as a Boy, 
he and his friends would make their way across the countryside. And when they came to an orchard wall that seemed too high and too doubtful to try and too difficult to permit their voyage to continue, they took off their hats and tossed them over the wall and then they had no choice but to follow them. This nation has tossed its cap over the wall of space and we have no choice but to follow it. Doesn't sound like a man ready to quit. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going long, so I'm going to go very quickly through these last things. I've said this already, Kennedy was not a visionary. I think he began to be enthusiastic about the promise of space, but he was more a pragmatic politician seeing space as an instrument of US power. And you can debate whether that was a good judgment. Uh, certainly it resulted in a positive image of the United States. This is the Apollo 11 crew under the sombreros in Mexico City uh, in the uh, uh, part of their world tour. And certainly the symbols, the images of Apollo have been part of our patrimony, of, of, of our symbols of the greatness of the United States as a nation. Uh, I think this cliche is empty of meaning. Uh, my sense is that the conditions that made Apollo possible cannot be replicated and it was a unique set of circumstances and using Apollo as a model for other grand enterprises is not uh, a valid uh, comparison. And controversially, uh, I think Apollo was bad for the space program. Uh, by defining the program as a race, once you won the race, there was no reason to keep racing. Uh, and, and there wasn't a, a long-term vision or plan to guide what to do after you got to the moon. And, you know, that, that's a, a, a budget graph. It's percent of the federal budget that's familiar to you all. But I think it tells a very dramatic story of, of how fragile the support for the program at the levels uh, needed to do Apollo was. It did create NASA as a large institution built around big engineering projects. And uh, the fight has, has been and continues to be how to maintain that institution and give it something to do worthy of, as the Augustine Committee said, worthy of a great nation. Um, we'll see whether that will happen or not. Um, I'm not even gonna talk about this. It's too ugly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kennedy said something in his UN speech in September 63 that was remarkably prescient, and again, forgotten. Why, therefore, should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Why should the United States and the Soviet Union, in preparing for such expeditions, become involved in immense duplications of research, construction, and expenditure? Surely we should explore whether the scientists and astronauts of our two countries, indeed of all the world, cannot work together in the conquest of space. Sending some day in this decade to the moon, not the representatives of a single nation, but the representatives of all of our countries. Well, in 1963, that was uh, pretty much a fantasy. But in 2011, might it be the key to the future? I think it is, and again, we can talk about that. Apollo happened. Arthur Schlesinger says when the history of the 20th century is written, uh, it is likely that one of the things that will be most remembered is the first trips away from the home planet. Uh, certainly the images of Apollo particularly the Earthrise image taken from Apollo 8 that's had a remarkable impact on our consciousness of uh, our position in the universe and the fragility of this planet, I think is a, a, a lasting benefit. And I think that, that the images of Apollo are images that will last forever. I quote myself here, I think it is one of the things that Kennedy will be most remembered uh, for uh, in, in terms of his presidency. And I'll let him have the last word. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things.
not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Floor is open for rebuttal, comments, questions. Mr. Lawton? Yes. Uh, I had, uh, well, in 1962, Kennedy was here and gave a very fiery that speech, speech uh, in the stadium yes. in favor of the space program. Very enthusiastic and so on. And then uh, he also mentioned collaboration uh, with the Soviet Union. Um, and then I read later, after a couple of years later, that when he met with Webb, he had cooled down an awful lot and wasn't terribly excited about cooperation with the Soviet Union. Well, he went up and down with the idea of cooperation. And then he said after the assassination, nothing happened. Well, that's not so. We know, we know what did happen, but um, they said after his assassination, nothing happened. Well. Ten days before he was killed, Kennedy signed a National Security Action Memo directing Jim Webb to run a government-wide study of how to cooperate with the Soviet Union. So I feel pretty strongly, even in the last days of his life, he was strongly in support of that. But with his assassination, Apollo became a monument to a fallen young president. Lyndon Johnson was not very interested in cooperation. The Soviet Union wasn't, at that point, very interested in cooperation, and so nothing happened. I mean, that's why the idea kind of disappeared. Hello? Yeah. You alluded to the fact that maybe we shouldn't have done the Apollo program first. Maybe there are some other things we should have done to build up in terms of our space capabilities. Can you amplify that a little bit? Did I say that? Uh, well, maybe I misinterpreted well, what you said. Well, it, it, uh, uh, it is certainly true that by going to the moon first, rather do, than doing the systematic buildup of low Earth orbit capability first and then venturing outward, we, we jumped the kind of standard vision of how to do space development. And by using up the moon as a destination, uh, as part of this competition, we make it very difficult, see President Obama, uh, to justify going back to the moon, even though, in my view, that should be our first destination as we leave the next time. Uh, so I, I don't disagree with w w w what you're saying, but I don't think I said it. <laughs> uh, so you read it into me. In, in. A lot of people would argue that, you know, the, the sh we spent a lot of time and effort justifying the shuttle and ISS, whereas maybe those weren't the right things to do. Yeah, well, but remember, what Kennedy wanted was a dramatic space thing that we, the U.S. could do before the Soviet Union. Something well beyond what the Soviets could achieve. Right. right. Yeah, and, and, and the moon was the answer to that requirement. He wasn't, again, he wasn't interested in systematic space development. He was interested in a political result in a Cold War competition. Yeah. You want to turn that off? It is on. <laughs> okay. Hold it close. Uh, very close. I, I'm intrigued by your observation about how NASA was uh, set up in set up in business by the massive expenditure of the Apollo program, and then has been had to focus on maintaining its institution ever since. Would you say the same is true about the AEC Department of Energy after the Manhattan Project? Uh, is, is, a sim is a similar dynamic going on, or are they handling it differently than NASA is? And, uh, and another, another interesting example is the Isthmian Canal Commission and, and for the Panama Canal. It was a huge undertaking of similar scale, and it went away completely. Um, well, because you didn't create a permanent institution to do it. It was right. a construction project. Uh, the AEC, I mean, the Manhattan Project, again, was uh, 
something with a finite end goal of creating a weapon. And basically, one started over after 1945 and created the Atomic Energy Commission and created the labs, and, and those labs still exist. Uh, we have not shut a Department of Energy or lab since. Uh, that's not quite true. There used to be two near Pittsburgh, Knowles and one other one. But I think there's been some consolidation, but not much. I mean, we still have Livermore, we still have Los Alamos, we still have Sandia, uh, et cetera. Those so were the AEC and the Manhattan Project were two very separate. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they really didn't, one didn't lead to the other, uh, and they certainly weren't the same institutional framework. I've always thought it was fascinating how about the time we committed to the Manhattan Project, the Germans punted. Yeah. You know, we had no idea. Uh, Professor, uh, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, you seem to suggest in the talk that um, the Apollo is a bad um, metaphor, or sort of image to be followed. You think it was sort of like a perfect storm sort of created that, and it's a, sort of bad to follow that. So sort of following that same logic, do you think it's wrong for you know President Obama to invoke this sort of Sputnik moment for the country today? Um, and if so, sort of like what do you see sort of as the next challenge for the country? And I mean, it, <laughs> is it wrong to use the Sputnik moment as sort of something to motivate the country? Well, first of all, I think he's wrong to use the Sputnik moment. I mean, our reaction, the U.S. reaction to Sputnik was a relatively conservative reaction. President Eisenhower said, yes, uh, we have to increase uh, uh, our education and improve our education, but there wasn't a massive injection of funds. That, I mean, if, if, if Obama were being historically correct rather than rhetorically uh, powerful, he would have said a Kennedy moment uh, or an Apollo moment, because uh, that's you know, when the big injection of funds. Uh, but the metaphor, I think, of, of, of a, I mean, one of the things that was in a slide I took out of this talk trying to keep it short, I wasn't very successful, uh, is, is a belief that large-scale, centrally uh, managed government programs were good things, uh, not a belief of high currency in this general state, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, critical uh, to, to uh, the assumptions underpinning Apollo was a kind of command mentality. Uh, and one of the reasons I say the Apollo metaphor is weak is you can't do that for social problems. You can't control things in the same way that uh, Apollo could be controlled because it was managing technology, not changing human behavior. And back then, probably impossible for the younger view to remember, political parties had discipline. You know, if the leaders of political <laughs> parties uh, uh, committed their parties to support something, it got supported. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, in his, in his consultations, uh, went to the Senate. He didn't think the House counted. Uh, he went to the Senate, got commitments from the both Republican and Democratic leadership of, of the Senate that if the president uh, proposed a big new space program, they would support it. And they did. And he got Sam Rayburn of Texas to who could control the, the Democrats in the House. Hard to do today. <laughs> I was wondering about the choice of Florida. You know, terrible thunderstorms, the highest number of hurricanes. I remember a rocket was destroyed by lightning. I think Apollo, one of the Apollo rockets was hit by lightning. I wonder why, yeah, they, Apollo didn't, 12. why they didn't either go for Texas or New Mexico or, you know, some much less weather, you know, violent yeah. weather prone area. Texas has, has hurricanes, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and it's even hotter than Florida. Uh, well, I, I mean, the short answer uh, is, is uh, water. Uh, the United States has more people than the former Soviet Union. The Soviet Union can launch uh, from now from Kazakhstan over vast empty tracks. Launching from New Mexico in their optimum uh, trajectory would carry you over populated areas and your first stage would fall on them. 
so uh, uh, inland sites were pretty well ruled out. And what about Brownsville, for example, where um, very little in the way of thunderstorms, you know, much better weather than Florida. Yeah, I mean... The even, even the trajectory out of there is still over twice uh, populated areas. So. It's not, it's not an optimal yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the at the sites that were considered. I'm pretty sure Brownsville or Corpus Christi, place like that, was considered. But there was the the tracking, the safety uh, sorts of things, infrastructure in place for the Air Force test range already in Florida. So even even with all the resources, there was concern about money. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm, you know, it's, the question is whether the mic trumps or... or well, I, I, I think mm -hmm. I, can, I can talk louder now. Yeah. Uh, Apollo had two goals, one of which was engineering, which, which we achieved, or landing on the moon. And you alluded to the second, which was... Thank you. And you alluded to the second, which was um, demonstrating to the world, especially to those countries that were trying to decide between a communist system and a, a capitalist democracy system. Did, did Apollo, do you believe it achieved that goal? Did it, did it demonstrate to the world that? And, and were any f countries influenced one way or the other to, to, to go into one camp or the other? Well, uh, there are two parts to that question. One's harder to answer than the other. Uh, I think any report from, of, of the people that, that tracked the overseas reaction to Apollo found it overwhelmingly positive. Uh, that, that this was viewed by the world as a really impressive achievement uh, of, of, of only a great nation could accomplish. Whether that led them to choices of social systems uh, is, I would think, would be very, very hard. Uh, I mean, the, the reaction to Apollo was a lot more positive outside the United States than it was inside the United States. I and mean, we had had the decade of the 60s, which uh, a New York Times columnist named Tom Wicker called a slum of the decade, you know, with all the assassinations and urban riots and, and getting bogged down in Southeast Asia. So uh, Apollo was a bright spot, but in a, in a rather negative uh, environment wh where that wasn't so true the rest of the world. So I, I think in terms of impressing the world, it did and continues to, the fact that the United States did that uh, continues to be a source of, impre uh, of, of positive uh, impressions of, of this country. So John, in that light, how do you view the international interest in re-engaging the surface of the moon with China going in 2012 and Russia and India, Japan? How, how do you view that? Um, in today's light? Well, um, let me differentiate robotic lunar missions and, uh, and human missions. Uh, I mean, we've got a very sophisticated mission called GRAIL on its way to the moon now. It's going to take a long time because it's solar electric propulsion. Uh, the, the, the rest of the world, with the possible exception of the Soviet Union, of Russia, is more interested in the moon than more distant destinations as an object to travel to. Uh, so, uh, China, you say, going 2012. China uh, has a lunar, robotic lunar lander which is scheduled for 2013, I think, Chang'e 2, uh, and then a sample return scheduled for 2017. I'm of the school that does not believe that China has made a decision to send humans to the moon yet. It's a logical thing for any spacefaring country to do, is to think about that. India has a lot of talk. Um, the resources to carry out an ambitious human program aren't there. Their Chandrayaan-1 mission had problems. They're doing a Chandrayaan-2 with uh, Russian cooperation that has a fair amount of ambition to it. Uh, the International Space Exploration Coordination Working Group, ISIG, just presented scenarios for global exploration uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in Japan. This is a group of, of 14 space agencies planning together. And they have a, that group has a strong preference for going back to the moon rather than uh, an asteroid. Uh, 
uh, the U.S. is pretty much alone in saying that um, uh, uh, we're not going to go back to the moon first. Uh, and I happen to think that's a mistake, but uh, me and a nickel doesn't get us to the moon. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Yeah, I was given the microphone, so I guess I should ask a question. But um, it, it, my question, I think you've already answered, but the, the comments to it, because it was related to the last one, is, I mean, your comments about Apollo being the gold standard for what NASA can accomplish, I think, is correct. And that's where we're stuck today is where we go forward. I think the shuttle was another high standard that NASA achieved. Um, and a lot of the comments we heard last week from Norm Augustine and so on was about how there's no point committing to something unless you put the resources in. And that's been the trouble in the last maybe 10 years or so for us. Um, with the light of the, the emerging nations, China and India, at least showing an interest, whether they have the capability yet to do the human space program the way that NASA did, do you see that as being the future? I mean, whether you go to the moon or whether you choose to go to Mars, um, is that the future given where we are now, based on the lessons from history, that we should be globally going yes, into I'm, space? Yes, I'm a strong believer that the only way that we're going to carry out a sustained program of human exploration is on a international basis. Doesn't necessarily mean everybody. Like this international group that I just talked about, China's not participating. India's a little bit on the sidelines. But the other major space countries, including Russia, are active participants in this planning. And I think some subset of the station partners is the basis from which we create the, the partnerships to move out. Professor, thank you very much for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Would you care to share your thoughts about why Houston was snubbed with the location for a shuttle? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, have no give you an out. I have no insight into that, uh, except I know a lot of people in Houston think the case wasn't very well made. <laughs> thank you for being here, sir. <laughs> uh. Could you, uh, back in the study of your histories, uh, the, in the, could you explain the reasoning for uh, Mr. Kennedy's idea of cooperating with the Russians uh, at that time, uh, and why, why was yeah. he considering that? Uh, Kennedy came out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, out of an intellectual environment. Uh, Kennedy was not particularly an intellectual, but he liked to surround himself with people with ideas. And one of the ideas that was nurtured in the Harvard-MIT axis in the late 50s was something called arms control, as opposed to disarmament. Small steps that could lead eventually to con at least controlling, if not stopping, uh, totally the development of armaments. And one element of that thinking was finding areas of mutual interest to cooperate with your adversary, where you could build up habits of cooperation. Uh, and, and Kennedy, uh, uh, or somebody writing for Kennedy in October, uh, anyway, in the fall of 1960 during the campaign, put out a very nice thought that space was one of those areas where it wasn't an area of military conflict, it wasn't uh, 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 armed yet, and it could be made an area of cooperation that created the kind of habits of very visible cooperation that could create the habits of working together and make uh, adversaries less likely to fight one another. Uh, I mean, again, you can argue whether that's a viable uh, international theory, but it's it, it, it it's pretty clear that's what Kennedy was thinking. You might mention that caption that was in November 12th. Yeah, uh, I, I mentioned it uh, briefly, but on November the 12th, 63, uh, as I said, Kennedy uh, signed a, a memo directing James Webb as head of NASA to run an interagency government-wide study of finding ways to cooperate with the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, that's why uh, some of the people that have written this history say that, that Kennedy's UN speech, which you saw, was all public relations and a graceful way of backing off of the Apollo commitment. I don't 
believe that. And my reading is that he, he, for these reasons, thought that cooperation was both a way of saving some money, but a positive move in re reducing the tensions. Again, remember this is October 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis, how close we came to nuclear confrontation. Kennedy walking away from that scared a little bit, uh, and Khrushchev also. Uh, Kennedy in June of 63 made a speech at American University called A New Strategy for Peace in which he laid out the need to find areas of working together. Uh, in August of 63, uh, we signed the uh, limited nuclear test ban treaty uh, as a first step, and space in his mind was next. I think, are we about done, or is there one more? One more, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Oh, thank you, and I think this will probably be a good one to, to end it on. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has made the argument that our NASA's purchasing power really hasn't changed a whole lot in the past few uh, decades, and that... Uh, probably our biggest problem is this adherence to the Apollo mindset that, that you talked about. And it's my personal opinion that uh, what we see with the uh, so-called Senate launch system is just continu a continuation of that same paradigm. What do you think it's going to take, both in terms of NASA culture and the political system, to change, to, to break us out of that mold so that we can actually figure out a way to, to live within the environment that we find ourselves in. Isn't it time for the reception? <laughs> uh, 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 but if I had a crisp, clear answer to that, I'd be, I guess, popular in Washington. Uh, I, I, I think there is a clash of visions going on, a, class of, a clash of, of cultures, uh, with one being what I'll call, for, this is a pretty inside audience so I can do this, a Griffin paradigm, and the other a Garver paradigm. Uh, the Griffin, I think Mike, in all honesty, wanted to return NASA to the excellent organization that carried out Apollo recreate the engineering capability, the systems management capability, recreate an or organization really able to carry out a good job. Uh, he didn't get the financial support from the White House, and the culture, I think, was resistant enough that uh, I'd say he failed in his attempt to reform the organization. Uh, the Democratic uh, leadership, and, and Lori Garver was behind a lot of this, my former student, uh, uh, said it's time to break that paradigm and proposed a very radical change, too radical, I think, and then botched totally the proposal uh, and dug a deep hole where it couldn't get an honest consideration. So what you see is a contention of models that will happen, Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, and Mike Griffin are testifying to the House on Thursday. The fight goes on, but the Griffin paradigm modified, I think, is winning. And how we break out of that? Let's have a drink. <laughs> well, thank you very much, John. Thank you all.